Hi, Kim. Hi, Jason. How are and you on this gorgeous Friday? I am so happy to have a little respite in the weather and to be able to just go outside and enjoy myself. And I am so happy that we are back here with another episode of Purple Things. Marvelous. Uh, this week, we are celebrating the current exhibit you see uh, here on the screen in front of you. Uh, this is Conversations with Weepy by Jamie Elkins. Uh, it is an absolutely incredible exhibit. We're uh, here celebrating its end. It's going to end tomorrow, actually, uh, November 7th, before we move on to our next exhibit. Uh, but it's uh, an incredible piece, and uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about it, Kim. Well, I tell people come for the circus tomorrow and stay for uh, this exhibit for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, Jamie has done an incredible job in the way that artists take one piece of inspiration and then make a multitude of emotions and color senses. And it, this is just a feast for the eyes and, and feelings really. Yeah, it's it reminds me of uh, Hakusai's 36 woodcuts of Mount Fuji from every sort of angle that he could see the mountain from. Uh, she has done that with Weepy, uh, the tree she uh, has named that's a uh, weeping birch in Yarmouth. You can go see it. In fact, uh, you did go see it, Kim, if I'm not mistaken. I had to go. I just, after I saw this exhibit and so many people in Cape Cod have said, you must see this tree. Um, I went and searched for it. It's not hard to find at all. It's in Yarmouth Port. And when you walk up to it, it is just the most incredible, majestic uh, experience. It's enormous. You can get underneath it and you're actually living and breathing with it. It's beautiful. Yes, I think I have a picture of uh, when you went with Betsy here to yes. go underneath yes. uh, Weepy. Uh, and it's really, it's an amazing tree. It's yeah. you know, centuries old. It bears the marks of everything that's happened to it uh, over the years. Uh, and you can see why uh, Jamie, she spent two years, I believe, uh, yeah. studying this tree, doing all of these different paintings based on it. Uh, and it's created this meditative space in the gallery that, you know, for all our wonderful exhibits, it, it stands out for me as one you can come in and just immerse yourself in uh, It's completely. like being in a forest every day. I mean, and, Absolutely. and that's what I think she, she really observed and was inspired by every inch of this tree. And there are so many different aspects to it. If you see the exhibit, you can, you just, she saw so many different things um, that she was able to really pull out and make just one inspiration of. Yeah, you see close-ups of the bark and, you know, the, the cuts and marks that humans have left on it. You see it uh, against the sky. Uh, one of them is taken from above, from a cherry picker view, uh, down at the tree as well. It's, it's fantastic to see, and I, I know you agree, uh, inspirational. It really is. It makes you think about all the ways there is to look at a thing. Um, and that's what all art is about, right? Absolutely. Uh, putting your perspective onto something. And you were truly inspired uh, by this piece. Um, in fact, I think we've got uh, uh, the painting you were looking at here. Let me find that one here somewhere. Uh, let's see. Yes, this painting is called Monkey Tree. And um, interesting that it, I, I didn't notice the title right away. Um, because the first thing I saw was an elephant and an elephant's trunk. And then when I saw the title, I thought, you know, this is the beauty of art and, and ekphrasis, this poetry inspired by art that you and I love so much because the viewer sees often what the artist sees and then often what she is inspired by. And it keeps this conversation going, this, this ongoing communication about art that doesn't stop. Yeah, looking at this painting, I mean, you could go to Weepy and find the perspective that this uh, painting was, uh, you know, inspired from. Uh, and there's absolutely something animalistic about it. I, I get elephant, I get that same thing. And then once I heard monkey too, I was like, oh, I see that uh, as well. It's really, hmm, 
all of the different angles uh, that she found evoked all of these different shapes, emotions, uh, feelings. Some of them were very human. Uh, there's this yes. one that looks just like a, a pair of legs, like twining into the sky. Um, yes. And all of them, of course, this is <laughs> some of my favorite, you know, reminded me of like the trees I used to climb as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at a tree for the first time and say, that's an adventure calling to me. Um, Absolutely. And you have a poem and it talks about, uh, I guess adventure is a word for what uh, <laughs> happened here, misadventure yeah. <laughs> perhaps. Um, Absolutely. But uh, tell me about uh, going from uh, Monkey Tree, this painting here to the, the poem we'll be uh, hearing today. So I do love elephants. I always have. There's something about not just their majesty, but we know them to be super intelligent, um, pack animals, very community oriented, very maternal in their love. Uh, but they're also like a one trainer kind of person when they're sort of domesticated, if you will, unfortunately, uh, because they are very much about their own pack. And uh, that just oh, has always spoken to me and just something so beautiful about them. And then I'm not sure, you know, the, the poet that writes to art, if you let yourself wander, you get to a place that maybe you didn't even know you wanted to write about or that existed. That's probably all art as well. Uh, and this is the poem that came out. But you're right. There is something about Ekphrasis that encourages you to take the next step mm -hmm. um, with art. Uh, and certainly you don't have to be, you know, writing art to do that. But uh, I think once you start writing in response to art, once you start thinking about how the art is moving with you and inspiring you, you can't not do that when you see a piece. Everything becomes richer for it. When I talk to people about this kind of poetry, I often say it's not just a description of what's going on on the canvas. It could be something happening just off canvas or way mm. off canvas. And what does it evoke? And clearly I made this huge leap, not only to see an elephant in this tree, but then to see a story that um, metaphorically had an elephant in it. Yeah, and I mean, there is so many people who are going to walk by Weepy every day and see a tree. Mm -hmm. It took an artist like Jamie yes. to come really? and really find the character uh, of this living being. Yes, and great point about Jamie, for sure. That's yeah. why we're grateful to them. Yeah. Uh, and I'd love to hear your poem. Uh, it's a, sort of a longer form poem than we featured on Purple Figs before, but it was so wonderful. I really wanted to <laughs> be able to share it. Uh, it, uh, is, it has a unique title though. So I wanted to go into that because I would love if both the painting and uh, this word uh, are in people's forefront. And I worked really hard and I watched a bunch of videos. So I think I've got the, the word down. Uh, Kintsukuroi, yes. it's a Japanese word. Yes. Uh, here, I actually have an example of it here. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? And without going into too much detail, maybe a hint of how that factors into the poem as well. Uh, yes, yeah, so kintsukuroi is a Japanese artistic process where you take a, maybe a broken piece of ceramic pottery and you mend it with gold. And I'm sure it's even more expansive than that. And you get a new piece of pottery. Um, and so in the poem, uh, I talk about a, a broken mother, basically, and her daughter, and how um, in, a, in a moment that they both share that was incredibly sort of tragic and intense, and then becomes resolved, um, there's this moment of kintsukuroi. Uh, I know they have uh, pieces of this style at the MFA, uh, mm -hmm. so you can, uh, you know, go see it. The thing I love about uh, reading it there, uh, you know, looking at these pieces, is that it's not just about the repair itself, but it's about celebrating and recognizing that that the which brokenness. brokenness. Yes, yes brokenness. that which breaks the Yeah a part of us too. So, uh, well, without further ado, I'd love for you to do the painting. So uh, here is Kintsukuroi by Kim Baker. I am hopeless. I watch every heart-wrenching video someone posts on Facebook about elephants. The baby Kenyan elephant that couldn't pry from her dying mother's side 
the elephant sitting vigil for her injured pal, Bella, the dog, at their Tennessee refuge. The adult female Zurich zoo elephants running to rescue one of their babies who trips and flips over. Watch them longingly as they shove with their trunks in tandem, in unison, in fierce and gorgeous pack love. Calculate the speed at which they arrive after the spill. Gauge the force necessary to right him quickly. As if they can keep him safe forever. As if they had never faltered themselves. And suddenly, I am back at Yardville Elementary School, standing gingerly in the middle of the playground with my best friend, Karen. My somewhat remedied club foot sewn up after surgery to stretch my ankle cord. To correct the gen genetics of birth so I could eventually walk better. It was recess. Don't play, don't move, let Karen walk you inside, she had said at breakfast. So I stood still. My kindergarten foot swathed in ankle socks, white as my everyday worry about upsetting the fragile nature of my mother's day. Then him, bounding by all boy and purpose and red intent, the dodgeball grazing my checkered hem as he zigzagged behind me to avoid colliding, his right black Converse sneaker scaled the incline of the back of my calf and I felt the sutures rip from their carefully stitched position, warm liquid saturating my sock, sopping my uncool orthopedic shod foot. And Karen, racing maniac all the way to Langham Way, to my mother sniffing Winston's and swigging just a nip of Tuesday liquor in the I Love Lucy kitchen. Then suddenly my mother's arm trunk nudging me to sit, the panicked clack of the wheelchair racing back, the jungle green Chevy hand me down, the reverence of St. Francis Hospital emergency room, the sterile area cold like her hands after she sobers, Dr. Peterson restitching as if practicing kinsukuroi, as if basting a quilt, saved. 50 years later, that twice tacked sympathetic place on my ankle still twitching, I sit vigil for my dying mother. Unable, unwilling to leave her ICU side, despite her having abandoned me time and again for a pack of cigarettes and a promise of gin, despite her having beaten me for being gay, despite her lying about smoking, about dying from lung cancer. They want to pry me from her side with their lengths of it's too late now ropes and there's nothing you can do tranquilizers. I wait willingly, my trunk enfolding hers, remembering that one glorious elephantine day when she moved heaven and earth. She lived without her coping addictions for hours. She ran to my side to rescue me from bleeding, to save me from at least one boy's overmotivated desire, trumpeting her love in my not yet deaf ear, bandaging temporarily my already scarred and forevermore crippled heart, golden with the kinsukuroi of her Tuesday love. Ooh. I, I wish there was an audience to applaud it. I really do. Um, this it's a ain't... hard poem to read, and it's a hard. It, it. I don't know that it was as hard to write, but when I read it the first time out loud, and for many times after, I cried. And I'm I'm not sure what the tears are, but it's very powerful for me too. I, for me, I just I connect so strongly with that memory of the vulnerability of childhood mm -hmm. and the knowledge that as we get older, more and more of us is scar tissue barely mm -hmm. holding us together. Right. It's like a real, it's a ship of Theseus situation mm -hmm. where you look back and you're like, oh, 
I feel like I'm the same person, but I don't recognize these things mm -hmm. that have kept me whole, that have put me back together in all the ways I've broken. Yes. Um, it's, it's a lovely experience. And I, I particularly love that it opens with these images of the elephants yeah. who's like humanity for lack of a better word is so evident when you sit down and actually watch them, yes. but they are so far beyond us and sort of the force that they possess mm -hmm. is something we can never understand. Just like the yes. force of the boy colliding inadvertently into you. Uh, well, their into the, the speaker. So yeah. yeah. Their focus is so clear. Um, they are so driven to protect each other and celebrate each other. It's amazing. I would like to ask you a question because I think perhaps for people who aren't as into art or poetry or have only, you know, have just started listening to Purple Figs, um, they might be curious because at no point during your poem did you talk about a tree. <laughs> right. Not this tree. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little about, and I know some of this poem, you know, has been with you for a while. What was the uh, catalyst uh, from this painting that sort of brought the poem to the state it's in now? So when I looked at this painting that is so beautiful, the elephant in a profile and the eye and what looks like a trunk for me just jumped out at me. And I thought, oh, I love elephants. How marvelous that she captured, you know, and I'm, it may not have ever been in her mind. She was painting maybe what she saw. Um, and I did not know that, that I would then say, oh, I love elephants and oh, those videos of elephants and go from there to my mother. But this poem wouldn't exist either, except that I had the experience of being with my mother when she died after a very difficult relationship our whole lives. And it was a beautiful thing to do. And there's just something about art. I don't know. Jamie painted something that touched me and, and almost connected the dots for me. And if you let yourself go and not think you have to describe exactly what you see. And I'm sure Jamie wasn't describing exactly what she sees either. She's feeling something and she's that emoting is coming out in her artwork. Um, if you're willing to, we talked about this last time, you know, like the, in theater, the willing suspension of disbelief, it's the willing suspension of wanting to write about or paint exactly what you see um, and just let it flow. Yeah. The thing that really, makes the exhibit so powerful for me is that for two years, she painted a single tree. Mm -hmm. And yet if another artist were to come and do the same exhibit, you would not get the same perspectives. Exactly. You would not get the same ideas, you know, put into paint. Um, like said earlier, you could find this perspective and all the other ones to mm -hmm. some degree or another, uh, but would you decide to paint them? Would you decide that this is the thing that I'm going to make today? Right. Uh, you wouldn't. <laughs> I, and I tell you, if you go and, and look at these closely, uh, you can see it a little bit in the, the piece here in the bottom right of the corner and, and sort of on the left trunk as well. The markings from where people have cut, carved their initials. And mm -hmm. there's another piece, uh, well, a couple of pieces, but one in particular focuses specifically on those carvings, on those scars. Yes. And the idea that these people have Beautiful. come by, left their mark, yes. and maybe never thought of Weepy again. Mm -hmm but those marks are now a part of it yes. uh, as long as it's going to live. Um, your poem actually helped me shift my perspective about the entire exhibit um, to think about the way a tree is this history of, of wounds that it continually grows from and branches out in incredible ways. Um, that's my connection. That is me seeing the humanity uh, thanks to you and thanks to Jamie as well. Um, and I appreciate your question about what that, there's no tree in basically in this poem, because it's important to me to honor the artist. And I do, if I like the poem, I like to share it and say, here was your painting. Here's what it inspired me to write and hope that what it says is I fell in love with your work. And I, this is what I, I celebrate about it. Um, and I often have more description of a piece because I want to do that celebration of the artist. Um, this just didn't happen to be one of those. 
Yeah, well, we are so grateful that uh, Jamie's work was here. I'm grateful to you, Kim, that uh, you shared this poem. Uh, next time, maybe I'll do a long one, but uh, I didn't. I didn't want to uh, take away. And I thought your poem was so. There's so much to uh, talk about, especially in relation to Ecrasis and to this exhibit uh, in specific. So, thank, thank you, you so much. That. And. Uh, I'll show you next time. Uh, this exhibit we said closes uh, this weekend, November 7th. So tomorrow actually uh, will be the last day. Uh, and then we're moving on to Hope. It's an open juried exhibit. Uh, typically at the end of the year is our member student faculty show. It's a chance for anyone who's a member or has taken a class at the center to uh, come and display work at no charge. And there's still no charge for members, but we wanted to open up to all sorts of artists. I mean, A, there's a lot of artists who have not been able to display for the past many months because of COVID. Uh, and B, we're excited to see what the uh, theme brings to people. So it is juried in the sense that only some of the work, you know, will be able to show on the walls, right. but all of the work is going to be uh, shown online uh, after the open uh, or after the exhibit opens and it opens next uh, Saturday, the 14th. Somewhere? Yeah. Check yeah. the calendar on yeah. your computer? Yeah. Yep, okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you're watching it this weekend, uh, drop off is on Monday. So there is still time to get a piece in. So um, please check it out. And uh, there's actually a sort of written and audio component as well, Kim. Did you want to mention that? Uh, yeah, so there's two exciting pieces in addition to uh, the traditional artwork that folks will bring in. Um, someone approached us a while back about a canvas mask project that she wanted to organize it, sort of in the vein of the um, AIDS quilt. And she had worked with AIDS patients as a physician years ago. And so she's organized artists to paint those. And our wonderful curator, Michelle Law, will be hanging those. And also there will be poems of hope in this exhibit. They will be physically displayed alongside the artwork. Uh, we have about um, a baker's dozen or so of, uh, of folks, and we'll have maybe half of those at least recorded by the poet themselves that you can snap a QR code with your smartphone and listen to the uh, poet read the poem while you're looking at the poem itself on the wall. Yeah, the arts are alive at Katuit Center for the Arts and That's here right. on Cape Cod. So uh, if you would have a piece, please bring it by. And if not, please come check out Hope uh, after it opens. It's going to be our last exhibit of the year. It'll run through uh, the end of December. Uh, so as I said last time, our gallery is safe and it's open. Uh, come by, wear your mask uh, and enjoy some respite from the just absolutely wild yes. state of the world. Right? Yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> Art um, heals, baby. Art heals. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, well, thanks again, Kim. I Thank think that's uh, been yeah. wonderful as always. <laughs> of course. And I will see you next time at Purple Figs and we'll see all of you out there as well. So take care, everybody. Be safe. Make art. We'll see mm -hmm. you soon. I forgot to close it. We'll see you all soon. <laughs> <laughs>